there are multiple documents that take the teaching of the rapture all the way back to the first century church. Now, I'm quick to admit, and I want to do this humbly, but I'm quick to admit that the timing of the rapture is one of the most controversial and hotly debated issues in the study of eschatology and end time events. I'm going to repeat that so that people will be clear. I am well aware of the fact that the rapture and the timing of the rapture is one of the most controversial issues and hotly debated topics in the world of eschatology and end time events. I saw a recent survey that was conducted among Protestant evangelical pastors uh, on their end time beliefs and it panned out this way. Overall, 36%, and this is recent, so this is a modern snapshot of where we stand in how pastors are teaching and preaching in evangelical Protestant uh, churches on the subject of end time events, the rapture, eschatology. 36% of pastors, the largest portion by far in this survey, align themselves with the pre-tribulation view, which simply believes and states that the rapture will take place before the tribulation period begins. And to be clear, that is what I strongly believe. I believe the full weight of proper biblical interpretation rests upon that. Not all agree, but this survey proved that the majority of pastors, even though there has been an attack upon eschatology, end time events, false teaching, heresy, false views, an attack against the rapture at all, 36% of pastors currently believe in the pre-tribulation view. Sadly, the second largest proportion, 25%, say that the concept of the rapture should not be taken literally. Now, I know where this comes from. I'm currently chairman of the board of one of the oldest uh, Bible colleges in North America, and uh, I have a lot of PhD friends on, on speed dial on my phone and uh, sit in meetings where discussions are had and am currently uh, still working on my own education, but it has become quite common in our liberal, modern church setting uh, that this view has found a lot of following, and that is the concept that the rapture is not to be taken literally. This is especially uh, true among uh, many denominations out of England, uh, not as strongly here in the U.S. of A., but uh, in Europe and England, much more common. And then 18% of pastors align themselves with a view that is commonly called post-tribulation belief, and that is that the rapture and the second coming are basically one event, and they take place at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Now, before we speak specifically about what is the partial rapture view, uh, trying to be mindful of all of the tens of thousands of new students that are joining us on a regular basis. Uh, it wouldn't be right to teach on this without at least giving a fundamental definition on what is the rapture. So in your notes, number one, what is the rapture? The rapture, or the catching away of believers to heaven, is a biblical doctrine. I want to state that again for emphasis. The rapture of the church or the catching away of the church is indeed a biblical doctrine. Scripture clearly teaches that at some point in the future, Jesus is going to return. Jesus said in John 14, another one of the classic rapture texts, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the believers who have died, the Bible tells us, first will rise from their graves, 
then together with them, those believers who are alive and remain on the earth will be caught up with the believers who have been resurrected from their graves to meet the Lord in the air and be with the Lord forever. That doctrine, often referred to as the rapture of the church, is a biblical doctrine. I oftentimes hear the word, uh, you know, people come up to me and say, well, you know, I can't find the word rapture anywhere in my Bible. And then some are more accusatory and they'll say, you know, you preachers and uh, ministers and evangelists and professors who teach on the rapture of the church, it's nowhere to be found in the Bible. You can't take my Bible and show me the word rapture anywhere in the Bible. Well, how foolish uh, for somebody in the English language to say that their English Bible is the only Bible that is accurate. Uh, the Bible, if you're a new student, was not written in English. Uh, the King James Version, one of my most loved versions of the Bible and loved by so many, I don't teach out of it sim simply because it's 18th century Elizabethan English and my goal is to reach new believers, unbelievers, help people in discipleship, fundamental Bible teaching. And so I use a very accurate modern English version that I believe helps people to better understand the scriptures. But if you're a new student, the original Bible certainly was not written in English. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. We have some Aramaic passages that have been translated through the years. Now, it is a true statement that the word rapture is not found in any English version of the Bible. But to state that all Scripture has to be held to the standard of an English language Bible is pompous and arrogant. Everything has to be held to the original text, whether it's the Hebrew and Aramaic texts of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New Testament. We go back to the original text. The word rapture is in the Latin Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Latin word that is used is raptus, R-A-P-T-U-S, raptus in the Latin language. And so people that have a Latin Vulgate translated by Jerome in AD 400, the word raptus is in there. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in our English Bible, the word raptus is translated caught up. Now from the Greek language, the original Greek New Testament if you were to read the classic passage on the rapture that I read to you out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in the Greek the word is herpazo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, uh, pronounced herpazo from the Greek. But whether you're reading Latin raptus or the original Greek herpazo or an English Bible caught up, they all mean the exact same thing. The word rapture simply means to snatch away or to seize or to be caught up. That is why in the English Bible it's translated in 1 Thessalonians 4 as caught up. And so don't get in an argument with some arrogant believer who just wants to thump an English Bible and say the word rapture is not found in the Bible. It is found in the Bible. It's found in the Latin Bible as raptus. It's found in the Greek original text as herpazo. It's found in 1 Thessalonians 4 in any accurate modern translation as caught up. Now, if it offends you to use the word rapture, I always tell people if you're going to be that belligerent about uh, semantics, then just say caught up. It doesn't make one bit of difference to me. In the Greek New Testament, the word herpazo is used 14 times. Now the issue is not will there be a rapture, but when will the rapture take place according to end time events? The pivotal question, and if you're taking notes, you might want to jot some things down as to what I'm going to say. The pivotal question about the rapture, which is why it's so debated in circles of theology, is will the church of Jesus Christ go through none of the tribulation? Will the church of the Lord Jesus Christ go through 
some of the tribulation? Or will the church of the Lord Jesus Christ go through all of the tribulation? Uh, pretty much without debate, other than what we would call full preterists. And I don't expect you to uh, remember all of these words, but a preterist is someone who believes that the rapture already took place in the first century. And they go back to Nero and, and the attack of Jerusalem and the siege by Titus and the Romans and Jerusalem. They believe all of that to be a fulfillment, and those are called preterists or full preterists. Don't worry about that in this teaching. But other than, and by the way, the preterist doctrine is no longer really accepted in modern scholarship because the dating of the book of Revelation is now known to be A.D. 95. And the preterist doctrine, the preterist view, depended upon the book of Revelation being written in A.D. 60 or before. So once we had enough documentation and historical data to know that the book of Revelation was written in A.D. 95, the preterist view is really not held in many modern scholarship circles. Let's get right into the teaching and answer this. What is the partial rapture view? Now, I've laid down what I believe to be essential, fundamental information to build any debate, any Bible study on the subject of the rapture. Uh, if you're a new believer and you have questions, be sure on our YouTube channel and on our podcast channel to go down through and scroll. You'll find that we have multiple teachings that provide answers to many of the questions you're going to have on the rapture. And we're constantly adding to that usually one or two uh, teachings on Bible prophecy and other Bible questions each and every week. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, be sure that you do that so that you'll be notified for all of those new teachings. Again, if you're taking notes, what is the partial rapture view? And I want to give to you a very basic definition because it really doesn't need a lot of detail. What is the partial rapture view? The partial rapture view teaches that only faithful Christians will be taken in the rapture, while unfaithful Christians, some might say backslidden Christians, will be left behind to go through the seven years of tribulation. Let me give that definition to you again because this is the question of our study today. What is the partial rapture view? The partial rapture view teaches that only faithful Christians will be taken at the initial rapture and that unfaithful Christians or backslidden Christians or cold and indifferent Christians will be left behind to go through the tribulation Period. Now, the partial rapture view has been embraced by only a small fragment of the evangelical uh, body of Christ. This is not uh, a notable teaching on the rapture. This is not an accepted teaching in proper scholarship. But as I mentioned earlier, it has received in recent months and years, probably directly uh, related to all of the false teachers on the internet, it has received a lot of attention, but it is not an accepted view by any recognized evangelical Protestant group. And the reason for that is there is no biblical evidence whatsoever to support the partial rapture view. And so people I'm sure going to ask, well, where in the Bible do they find uh, this view and, and why do they uh, launch it? Well, if you'll go to your Bible, to Matthew chapter 25, I'll show you where uh, they fall off the theological wagon. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, uh, is the parable of the ten virgins, uh, five wise and five foolish. And when you get a chance, take a, a moment to read it. But it is this passage of the parable of the ten virgins, five foolish, five wise, that is their quote-unquote biblical proof for the partial rapture. They believe that 
this parable refers to believers who have their oil and their fires are lit and they're found ready and because they're ready and because they brought ample oil and because their fires are lit, this represents Christians who are on fire for the Lord, Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit and the rapture takes place and they're allowed into the wedding feast and those Christians who allowed their fire to go out they had no uh, genuine relationship with God or with the Holy Spirit and had uh, backslidden or grown cold and indifferent are left behind and without giving a lot of teaching, which is uh, pretty straightforward in your understanding when you read the passage, they misinterpret Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13. That is basically the sole foundation for the teaching of the partial rapture view. However, the five virgins whose lamps did not have any oil are not symbolic of believers who are left behind. It is describing unbelievers who are left behind. Furthermore, Matthew uh, chapter 25 is written to the Jews. If you're a new student of the Bible, here's something that will help you in understanding all of the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew was written to the Jewish people. So when you read the entire book of Matthew, you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Matthew is writing this book specifically to a target audience, and that target audience is the Jews. And because Matthew is writing specifically to the Jews... now. I'm not saying that the book of Matthew needs to be ripped out of your Bible if you're not Jewish. Obviously, there are many things in the book of Matthew that are very important to those of us who are Gentile believers. All I'm saying is that if you're going to properly understand and interpret the book of Matthew, you have to remember that it was written by Matthew specifically to a target audience that was the Jewish people. The key verse is verse 12, where Jesus said in this parable to those who are left behind, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Well, that in itself almost is case closed. Jesus said in verse 12, Truly I say unto you, I do not know you. He's specifically speaking about unbelievers. He's not talking about Christians that are cold or indifferent. He draws a line that helps us to understand exactly who he's talking about, and it is unbelievers. The essential element in the parable is the oil in the lamps being symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Those who have the Holy Spirit living in their hearts will be taken in the rapture because they are truly Christians. And so those that are taken are represented by those who are waiting, those who have lamps, those who have oil, those who have fire. These are all symbols of true, authentic Christians living ready to meet the Lord. Those that are left behind may have a form of religiosity, but do not have a genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close by giving you three reasons why the partial rapture view is not biblical. If you're taking notes, write that down. Three reasons why the partial rapture view is not biblical. Number one, the partial rapture view divides the holy church. The partial rapture view divides the Holy Church or the body of Christ. Uh, while the scriptures portray a difference in God dealing with the saints of the Old Testament as compared with the saints of the present age, there is also a difference between the church and the tribulation saints. Very important that you understand this because many questions that come in uh, revolve around this misunderstanding. People say, well, if, if the church is not going through the rapture, and let me be clear again, I wholeheartedly believe that the weight of proper biblical interpretation rests upon the rapture is the next major prophetic event in the calendar of God, 
And after the rapture, the next major prophetic event will be the seven years of tribulation. Abundantly clear, the rapture takes place before the tribulation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, Jesus himself said it. Because, speaking to the church, you have persevered, I will keep you from this great hour of testing. Jesus himself in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 tells the church, I will keep you from this great hour of testing, speaking of the tribulation. He didn't say, I will keep you during. He didn't say, I will keep you through. He said, I will keep you from this great hour of testing. And consequently, after Revelation 3 and verse 22, the church is never mentioned again. Revelation 4 and 5 give us a prelude before we go into the chapters that deal specifically with the events of the tribulation period. And the seven years of tribulation are taught from Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. And do you know what's not mentioned one single time in Revelation 6 through 19? The church. The church is never mentioned one single time time after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. Why? Because the church is not on the earth during the tribulation. Back to the question. People say, well, who are all of these saints in Revelation chapter 6? People will be saved during the tribulation. But the church age saints are raptured before. But God is going to continue to propagate the gospel in miraculous and manifest ways, even in the seven years of tribulation. 144,000 Jewish evangelists are raised up. Revelation speaks of 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes who will be separated and anointed by God to preach the true gospel during the tribulation. And the Bible says that the result of the preaching, and not just those that are raised up in the 144,000. We have two witnesses that will preach. We have an angel that preaches. The gospel is preserved and protected and propagated throughout the tribulation period. And the Bible says a multitude that no man could number are going to be saved during the tribulation. Be sure to get this in your notes if you don't already have it. In Revelation 6, that multitude that no man could number are the tribulation saints. They are not the church that was raptured before. Jesus said in Revelation 3.10, what? I will keep the church from the great hour of testing. The church has been raptured before the tribulation. And in Revelation 6, we see the multitude of those who will come to Christ. And we know that the Old Testament saints, people always ask me, what about all of the Old Testament believers? Those who by the light of the Old Testament law lived in righteousness. What about them? When will they be raptured? They will not be resurrected until the end of the tribulation. And we know that at that time, the raptured church before the tribulation, the rapture again, listen carefully, the rapture is Christ coming for the church before the tribulation. Well, what about the second coming? That is at the end of the tribulation, and that is Christ returning with the church. Before the tribulation, Christ comes and catches up the church. He comes for the church. The second coming, at the end of the tribulation, He returns with the church. And it is at the end of the tribulation, at the second coming of Christ, that the Old Testament saints will be resurrected and then later judged. For sake of time, I have a teaching coming up that will deal with all of the specific judgments to help you to understand that chronology. The second reason why the partial rapture view is not biblical is it's based upon our works and not upon the work of Christ. Those who teach the partial rapture view, believers who are living on fire for God are taken, cold, backslidden, indifferent believers, left behind because their works were not valid, their works were not current, 
left behind? Well, that violates everything the Bible teaches us about the cross. That violates everything the Bible teaches us about grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. You're not saved by your works. Faith produces works of righteousness, but you're not saved by your works. You're saved by faith and by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, highlight that in your Bible. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Gifts are not worked for. Gifts are given as tokens of love to those with the humility to receive. And in just a moment as we pray the prayer of salvation for those of you who need to make peace with God or who perhaps are cold and indifferent and need to come back to God, you need to be mindful of this. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the cross. Faith in Christ. Faith in the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of all sin. By the shedding of His blood, there is the forgiveness and total absolution of all sin. Bây giờ chúng ta coi cái bài tiếp theo này, nó là bài số bao nhiêu đây? Qua bài tiếp theo là bài, nãy là bài số mấy rồi? Bài số 6 xong rồi phải không? Hoàng chờ thầy chúc ha. Rồi bây giờ chúng ta tới bài số 6 luôn ha. Tới bài số 6 nha. Một vật thực hiện dao động điều hòa với phương trình như màn hình của các em quan sát nè. Xác định biên độ và pha ban đầu của dao động là bao nhiêu? Đúng không ạ? Biên độ là chữ A. Pha ban đầu là chữ phi. Như vậy, bây giờ chúng ta so sánh với phương trình tổng quát x bằng A cos của omega t cộng phi. Nhìn vào đây chúng ta thấy biên độ A nó bằng là 10 cm. Pha ban đầu là chữ phi, anh này không có thì coi như nó là bằng không, đúng chưa hai Omega của các bạn là bằng 2 bi nè, t nè. Còn phi nó không có thì coi như bằng không, như vậy pha nó bằng không, pha ban đầu bằng không. Đúng không? Đó là câu A. Bây giờ câu B. Tìm pha của dao động tại thời điểm 2,5 giây. Như vậy các bạn thế T bằng 2,5 giây vào cái hàng này nè là xong. Như vậy chúng ta có pha dao động các bạn trả lời nha. Pha dao động tại thời điểm 2,5 giây là các bạn thế vào 2 bi nhân T là 2,5. 2,5 là 5/2 đó các bạn. 2 với 2 đơn giản hết như vậy chỉ còn 5 bi. Đơn vị của góc này là radian, đúng không ạ? À? Các bạn lưu ý chỗ này cho thầy nha. Pha dao động là cái góc Góc thì có đơn vị là radian Câu C Tọa độ của chất điểm tại thời điểm 10 giây Thì các bạn thế 10 giây vào nguyên cái phương trình lý độ này thế thôi Chúng ta có x10 nè 